I do want to take a moment and just say thank you for loving on us uh, during the newborn uh, stage. Uh, a dear lady friend who's had six. Wow. Uh, she said, newborn life is like being in the trenches. <laughs> I said, that is so true. Um, and so thank you for loving on us. You, you really have exemplified the heart of this house, which is doing a church as a family. And uh, you guys have been so kind and so respectful. And part of that kindness uh, was you let me have a three-month vacation where I just slept and relaxed and did nothing for three months. So, so relaxing. Some of you are like, wow, that's amazing. And then those of you who have had children are like, what a lie. Um, uh, so thank you, though. But it has been three months since I preached. Uh, so I warn you, I'm praying that as I speak, that the Holy Spirit gives you the interpretation because it's going to just, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Three months. It's, it's like Isaac digging the wells. There's, there's just a lot there. Uh, but the next thing that I am going to say uh, is, is a little bit shocking, and, and I have a feeling that it's going to shake you like it's been shaking us. In the last couple of months, we've had people come to us and say this, and we've also heard it from, from different friends who are pastors. They're, they're hearing the exact same thing told to them. Um, there's individuals who are saying, I am questioning if God is real. And these are not people who have, who have been on the fence with the Lord. These are people who have been saved uh, and very active in the things of the Lord for maybe six years or even 60 years. And they're coming and saying, I don't know if Jesus is real, and I'm questioning if it's worth it, if he's worth even following. And to hear that, it, it breaks your heart. I, I know that, that, yes, there's an emotional time after you've given birth, but I've never cried so much when you have someone say that to your face. I, I'm questioning, is, is he worth it? Is he real? And it, it shakes you to your core. And the reaction that you have from that is the same reaction that the prodigal son's father had where his heart was breaking for the son that, that left and chose. It's a choice. And so there's a turning that's been taking place. And imagine what the heart of God is. His heart would be broken and torn just like our heart is just in hearing that. But you can see in the natural, there's a, a spiritual tug of war that's taking place. And if you don't see it in the natural or in the spirit, just like Dad said, turn on the TV for a good five minutes, and you can see that there is a spiritual tug of war that is happening right now for the souls of humanity. And, and, and we know that our fight, it is not against flesh and blood. It is against the principalities and the darkness of this age. We know what the weapons are in our arsenal, and we know that they are mighty in pulling down the strongholds. We know that we've been equipped with the armor of God. We have the power of prayer. We know this. We have the confidence of knowing this, but we can also see that there is a spiritual battle that is taking place. It's a seesaw of emotions for individuals right now, and it is heart breaking. It is wrenching to know that there are people whose lives are shaking. Why? I think Jesus said because they built their house, their, their life on the sand instead of the rock. So you hear this and it echoes what we were literally prophesied about in the book of Hebrews. I just want you to listen to this. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 27. The writer of the Hebrews told us everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. And this goes back to what I preached on three months ago. And if you don't remember, that's quite okay because that was a long time ago. But the last hour sifting, it, it's that last hour sifting. And then I said uh, three months ago, I said the last hour sifting has begun. And you see the ramping up of this even more. There's a sifting that's taking place. And our heart should not be, oh, well, they're being sifted. Oh, that's really sad for them. Our heart should examine our heart. God, search my heart. 
Examine me. Where am I found? Yes, I'm concerned about the other person, but what is, we get the best advice from flight attendants. Put your oxygen mask on before helping others. And I always thought that was so cruel. There was, there was a flight attendant one time in our travels, and they said, pick your favorite child after you've done your own mask. And I was like, oh, that's horrible. But it kind of is true. If you're all alone, you know, you got to, you know, pick your favorite kid. Um, anyways, it kind of does make you sit there and go, I've got to examine my own heart before I'm turning and looking at everyone and everything else. So where am I found? And in this last hour sifting, in this moment where things are shaking, our heart is to be found in the river of God. Now for the past three months, I have heard over and over and over and over again from the Lord. And I've tried to get away from it. I've tried to say, okay, God, I've got it. Thank you. You can move on. I clearly hear you. But when the Lord keeps repeating something, it typically means you haven't quite got it just yet. And I really need you to lean into it a little bit more. And I keep hearing the Lord saying, Michelle, I am your river. Michelle, I am your river. There is a river that is available for you. And I want you to get into the river. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the river of God. But it would be an injustice to just grow our knowledge about the river of God and not let our heart dive deep into the real river of God. Does that sound good? Does that sound good? Thank you. If you were Grace, I'd say, say yes, ma'am, but that's a different story. So I'm a dreamer. How many of you in here dream, like prophetic type dream? Wow, Church of the Supernatural here. Um, I have a lot of dreams. That's, That's normally the way that the Lord speaks to me is through dreams. Um, I had a minister one time, I I was hearing him preach, and he greatly offended me. Uh, He said that if you're a dreamer and you have prophetic dreams, that it's typically because you talk so much during the day, (laughs) the Lord cannot speak to you. And so he has to wait till you are completely sound asleep for him to be able to speak to your heart. Uh, So I'll ask that question again. Any of you in here dreamers? (laughs) Okay. Okay. And uh, I would take great offense to that, but the truth is, I love to talk. Um, silence scares me, and if there is silence, I will fill it with just something. I just, I, I, I enjoy talking. And uh, so the Lord has to wait till I am asleep. And so during this season of newborn stage, uh, there is not much sleeping. Uh, in fact, it's sleep deprivation, and so there's not much dreaming Uh, It has to kind of be turned into a vision because there's no sleep. Uh, But the Lord knew that this season in our life was coming. It's a very short season. And uh, so he was so kind to give me this dream uh, two weeks before Zoe was born. And in this dream, uh, I saw this building, and it was an aerial view of the church. And around the church was a river. And then immediately I'm, I'm on the ground, and I see in the river children, only children, playing. And then I see, sitting on the banks of the river, adults who have their feet in. It was kind of like one foot in, and it was up to their ankle. And they had another foot sticking out on the bank of the river. And then under the maple trees, there's three here on the property, there were individuals that were sitting in lawn chairs, and they had these big black uh, sweatshirts on, the hoodies over their head, and they're just miserable, and they're complaining, and they look like Sour Patch Kids. And so I woke up from the dream, and I didn't have to be a Daniel or a Joseph to have that dream interpreted. It's very clear. And I went to Jesse, and I said, this is the dream I had. And we both talked about it, and we were reminded of Revelation 3.15. Jesus says there are three types of believers, right? There's the hot. Those are the children who are in the river. You say, why children? Because Jesus said, let the children come unto me. We're to have that childlike faith, not childish, but a childlike faith that's looking at the Lord saying, whatever you want to do, you are my father. I have full trust in you. I follow you, and I say yes to you. And so you've got the hot that are in the river. You've got the cold who are sitting under the trees. I love it. They're in the sweatshirts. They're shivering. They're critical. They're analyzing. They're criticizing. And then you have the lukewarm that's sitting on the riverbank, and you've got one foot in the river, only up to the ankle, and one foot on the bank, just in case you need to hop out if you don't like how the river's flowing. 
That goes against what I'm comfortable with. I don't like that. Not for me. But if I need something, I'm going to get my foot right back in the river. But I've got one foot on the world. And you have a generation that develops like Elijah did. And Elijah was dealing with a generation who was dancing with the Lord and then dining with the devil. And so there's that double-minded man, unstable in all of its ways. And so Jesus said in Revelation 3.15, he actually says, Give me the hot, and I'll even take the cold. But what am I going to do to the lukewarm? Spit it out. One translation actually says, Vomit. You make Jesus want to puke. So much fun. But, but he's, he's frustrated. Why? Because you've got that seesaw of commitment. That seesaw of commitment. So the stream, I had it. I told Jesse, didn't think much about it. And uh, a couple days later, we, uh, we're having breakfast as a family. And every morning, we ask Grace. We say, Grace, what did you dream about last night? And the reason why is we're trying to make the supernatural natural. And the Lord loves to speak to us through dreams. And we just say, Grace, what did you dream about last night? That's the only question. And she looked at us and she said, I had a dream that there was fire on the roof of the church. Well, my mom, she's eating her scrambled eggs, and I've never seen her go into such intercessory prayer in my life. <laughs> she's binding, she's loosing, she's pleading the blood. She's like, Jesus. I'm like, Mom, eat your eggs and let her finish her, her dream. She said, well, Grandma, the, the fire didn't burn down the building, but the fire, the flames, turned into trees. Well, when she said that, my dad, who's standing in the kitchen, he looks, and he's fixing his, his breakfast, which every morning, it's sardines on toast. <laughs> it, it, it smells worse than it sounds. It is, whoo, that's why he has no hair. It's just pure oil. Everything's just slip and slide. And... Um, so he's fixing his sardines on toast, and he turns, and he looks at Grace. He said, Grace, what did you say? And Mom, at this time, she stops binding and loosing. And she said, Grandpa, the flames on the roof, the fire on the roof, it turned into trees. And he said, what kind of trees? And, and Grace said, fruit trees, all kind of fruit. And we ran through the, the forest of the fruit trees, and we ate the fruit, and then there was a great big river, like a circle around the church. And we jumped in the river, and we ate the fruit, and we swam, and we had a wonderful time. And I said, tell me that one more time, just a little bit slower. And we had her tell it to us again and again. And, again. and for a four-year-old, it didn't change. There was no adding. There was no subtracting. That girl had a God-given dream. And I know that the Lord was so kind to kind of preface the dream with the one I had, but it was a reminder, we have to examine where we are. And if you know anything about the Word of God, and, and I love Grace, but she has not yet been to Bible school, nor has she read Genesis to Revelation. We're still working on reading, you know, hat, cat, go, stop, no. But if you know anything, you know that that was a God-given dream. And it, and it came through a child to remind us, where are we? And clearly, when you look around, you can see that the lukewarm Christian, it just doesn't exist anymore. It's still there, but it's not as prevalent. You're seeing that the rubber has hit the road. You're seeing clearly that the seeker-friendly church, it just doesn't have the same impact. It's not as appealing the, the me-centered sermons where it's all about me, myself, and I, it just doesn't leave the same flavor of taste in your mouth. You're like, well, that's great. I, I want to know what the Word says about me, but I want to know more about Him. And, and, and our heart is searching for the pastor who, who is actually preparing their sermon in prayer, not in practice. And our heart is leaning for this more, and it's what we're desiring more. And, and we're just seeing that the me-centeredness has shifted. The lukewarm is just not there. I heard this statement many years ago, and it, it really hit my heart. It said that the church is called to be a battleship, not a cruise ship. 
And I thought, that's really good. It's called to be a battleship, not a cruise ship. And sadly, for way too long, it has morphed into a luxury cruise liner. The glitz and the glam and the comfort. And, and yes, I'm thankful for these blue chairs because we sat on metal chairs in a barn for way too long. But the comfort and the ease. And the Lord is saying, I've called you to man your stations, to put on the armor of God, and to get battle ready, fighting the good fight of faith. That's what we are called to do in the river of God. So this morning, let's look at what the river of God is, and let's open our Bibles to the book of Revelation. Revelation 22, the last book and the last chapter. The river of God tells us in the book of Revelation that it runs from the very throne of God, It's his presence in Revelation 22. And we see this in verses 1 through 2. And we're going to read this and break this down as we read it. It says, Then the angel of the Lord showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal. There is purity in his river. Flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb down to the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. Now we know that the tree of life was destroyed uh, in the book of Genesis through the decision that Adam made. And we know that the tree of life was restored to us through the work of the cross by Jesus. And because of that, we now have a gardener. And his name is Jesus. And he is the vine, we are the branch, and he prunes us so fruit is produced. Hallelujah. It says, bearing 12 crops of fruit. 12 crops of fruit. Everyone say fruit. Fruit. Hallelujah. Yielding its fruit every single month. 12 crops of fruit. 12. So that 12 does, of course, represent the 12 tribes of Israel. But it also uh, can represent the 12 months of the year. So the Lord is saying that you are going to be fruitful every single day. Every single day, no matter what you are facing. There's an incredible scripture in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 1 and verse 3, and it actually says that you are like a tree planted by the waters. You're not going to be moved and fruit will be produced. And that word tree in the original Hebrew actually translates evergreen evergreen so when the lord looks at you he says you're an evergreen no matter what season that surrounds you you are an evergreen so you might be in a summer season life is great everything's prosperous it's green it's verdant there's just life flowing all around you you're an evergreen you might be in a season where it's winter things are dry Things are are not working. There's death that surrounds you. Nothing seems to be going right. Guess what? You're an evergreen. And not only are you an evergreen, but you are planted next to the river of God, which means your roots are running deep and receiving nourishment from the water that flows from the throne of God. So fruit's produced. It's John 15. You abide in him. He abides in you. Fruit just happens. Glory to God. I've missed being up here. Glory to God. Oh, thank you for missing me. Okay. It says the leaves, the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. If your heart is breaking for the nation of Israel, if your heart is breaking for even the nation of America, for Canada, whatever nation the Lord's put on your heart, get in the river. It starts with us. And healing will come. So if you're taking notes, you can jot this down quickly. It says his river, we see that his river runs throughout the word. First in Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. This is the law of first mention. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty close. Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, we see the river of God. We see it throughout the word, but specifically in Psalms 46 and verse 4. It tells us that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 47 tells us that there are depths to the river. There's height, there's width, there's length to the love of God. Zechariah 14 and verse 8. 
Also in the book of John, Jesus stands up in John chapter 4 and in chapter 7, and he says, whoever is thirsty, come and drink of me. You take a big drink of me, you're never going to thirst again because out of my belly flows rivers of living water. Hallelujah. And again, we see it in the book of Revelation. So the river of God represents God's life-giving presence. So this morning, I feel like before we all step into what God has for us, and I believe for many of us, the Lord has put in your heart great courage for you to step into, that there is a destiny, there, there is a great calling in your life for you to impact those who are around you, whether it be your children, your family, your workplace, the, the government, the state. And the Lord is saying before you step into that, the first place you have to step is into the river of God. You have to get into his river. Let's turn to Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 12, portions of it. But this afternoon, after you enjoy the last day of summer, I encourage you guys to read this, Ezekiel chapter 47. I take the time and just read it. But we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12. Hallelujah. It says, the man, we know who the man was. The man brought me back to the entrance to the temple. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side, say side, of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside of the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side, say side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through the water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through the water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through the water that was waist deep. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross. Because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, it was a river that no one could cross. Let's skip down to verse 12, and we're skipping over good stuff. We're we're actually seeing that the salt water becomes fresh water. And I just want to say this, the salty places of our life, the places where we just don't think that, the, that purity and holiness and his, his, his touch can ever reach, the salty places become fresh when he touches. Verse 12, fruit trees. When, when we read this, I want you to keep in mind what we just read in Revelation 22. I want you to also keep in mind a dream that a little four-year-old had. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. (laughs) Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Say, my fruit will not fail. (laughs) Hallelujah. Every month, every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. So the first thing I want us to notice in this scripture, there's so much there. The first thing I want us to get is it was Ezekiel who had to step into the river. The Lord was there. He was there. But, but he didn't do what a sibling would do and stiff arm Ezekiel into the river, push him in. No, he said, there's a river. It's your choice. You can go ankle deep. You can go knee deep. You can go way steep. You can swim. It's your choice. It's your call. But there's the river. Here's the entrance. Now you get to choose. And so the Lord is the one who's saying it's your choice. And Ezekiel is the one who chose to no longer be a bystander, but to instead get into the river. And so it is our choice. It it is my choice whether or not I want to be ankle, I want to be knee, I want to be waist, or I want to be swimming in the river of God. It is my choice. Now, we have a choice, but this morning, I believe the Lord is reminding us there is a river, and that river is flowing from the throne of the Lamb of God. 
And we have a choice to get into it because wherever the river went, life came from it. The the salty places became fresh. The fruit was forever on the tree. There was actually no seasons. There was no seasons. Fruit was just produced. An evergreen was birthed all because of the river of God. So for some of us, we are trying to figure out the house. How is this going to work? How, how are we going to see freedom? How is this going to change? How is this going to happen in my life? And we're trying to figure out the how and the why and the when. And the Lord is just standing there at the bank of the river, just like he did with Ezekiel. And he's saying, there's a river. There is a river. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of things that we cannot figure out. But the Lord is standing there and he's saying, there's a river. There is a river of life that is flowing from the Lamb of God. I have really good news for you today. There is a river. Turn to your neighbor and say, there is a river. Oh, there is a river. And when you get into the river of God, the debris of life gets swept away. All the junk All the stuff that we've been carrying, it gets swept away in the river of God. The worries, the fear, the concerns, the sickness, anything that we face, it gets swept away in the river of God. There is a river. And that river flows from the very veins of Emmanuel. And he's looking at you today with love in his eyes and a voice like a mighty rushing water. And he's saying, there is a river. There is a river, and it is available for you today. Hallelujah. There is a word picture that's painted with Ezekiel, and it's a type and shadow of what was to come with Jesus. But the word that we keep hearing, and every time I would read it, it would just stick out like a a, a sore thumb, the word side, side, side. And it it is a type and shadow of what was to come with Jesus. We know this, that when Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, becoming the sacrificial lamb for our sins, what did they do? They pierced his side, and from his side flowed water. From his side flowed water. And it's that water that brings the new creation to life. It's that water that brings the reconciliation We have been reconciled to the heart of our Father through the blood and the water of life of Jesus. Glory to God. And you hear this and you just go, whoa, he might be bigger than me. He might have things more under control than I do. He might be the Alpha and the Omega, which means he knows how it all started and he knows how it's going to end. And I'm found in between the bookends of his story, of his story, which he's so kind to write me into his story. He's so kind to include us into the story that he is writing and that he has written. So there is a new birth that is available to you, but here is your warning. And I want you to listen to this very, very closely. Whenever you go swimming, there's normally a sign. If there's no lifeguard on duty, it says, uh, swim at your own risk. They got that from God. Here's your warning. Your yes to entering into the river comes with losing yourself. It's not fun. I think Jesus put it in harsher terms. He said, crucify the flesh. That means something has to die. Crucify the flesh, pick up the cross, follow after me. I can't tell the river where to go and how to flow. Because then all of a sudden, I'm the one who's in charge. And I do not want to be in charge. So saying yes to entering into the river of God comes with losing yourself. It means I am going to be uncomfortable. I am going to see things that I'm not used to. I'm going to experience things that I don't necessarily like. But I know that his ways are higher, his thoughts are higher, his plans are higher, and I want to be found in the river of God. You read the word of God, you look at the life of Joseph, and you see a man who was found in the river. 
you, you see a man who went with the flow of the river of God. You think in his heart and in his mind he wanted to be in jail, falsely accused? Do you honestly think that? No. Get in the river. Get in the river. But when you get in the river, a part of you has to die. The old man, the old man is swallowed up just like the Egyptian army was swallowed up by the Red Sea. And the old man stays at the bottom, and what comes to the surface? The new creation. The new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things, all things are brand new. Why? Because I have been birthed in the river of God. That's where I'm found. That's where I'm swimming. Jesus looks to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, and he says, Are you thirsty? Come and drink of me. It's a river that will never run dry, and from your belly will bubble up a gushing water that's going to spring to eternal life. I recommend you drink of me. And this woman, she said yes. She said yes, and she actually became an evangelist for her entire town overnight. No Bible school, no training. Goodness gracious, she didn't even work the greeting table for a couple years to see if she was faithful and true. The Lord just pushed her, pushed her into the river at that point. She said yes to swimming, and next thing you know, she's seen her entire town saved. Glory to God. Why? She drank deep. She drank deep. And Jesus this morning, he's standing up, and you can just hear it. John, he says, from his mouth, when he speaks, it sounds like mighty, rushing water. And from his mouth, he's saying, out of my belly will flow rivers of living water. But he's so kind because he doesn't just say, hey, this is for me only. He turns it on its head, and he says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water out of your belly. And and you read that and you hear it and a part of you, the religious part of me, says the hypocrisy. How How could rivers of living water flow out of me? God, don't you know who I am and what I've done and where I've been and what I do? God, how could rivers of living water flow out of me? But Paul I love this because he answers the question. He says, do you not know you are the temple? Do you not know you are the temple? And we read, or we have been reading throughout the word, that the river of God flows from the throne of God, and he chose to set up residence in us. So from his throne, from my belly, flows rivers of living water. Whoa, that's really cool. Out of my belly, out of your belly. Everyone touch your belly. Say, out of my belly flows rivers of living water. And those rivers of living water, it's available for you. It's a river for your marriage. It's a river for your children. It's a river for your finances. There's a river for your health. I believe the Lord has a river for this church. There is a river of life pouring out of us because God Almighty looked at us and he said that heart that is broken, that is destroyed, that has been tainted by the world, I want that heart to be my home. And he set up residence in us and out of my belly flows rivers of living water. Whoa, glory to God. So this morning, I believe God wants to flow through us. Why? So that every single season of our life, the times where things are going really good, that we're in evergreen. And in those seasons where it's just, it's a little bit more difficult. Things just aren't as green. Things just aren't as fruitful in our hearts. He looks at you and he says, you are an evergreen. There's fruit being produced from your life. No matter what season we're in, there's fire on your roof. There's fire on your roof. And it doesn't consume and burn you down. It refines you. Ooh, there's fire on your roof. It brings the gold to the surface. There's fire on your roof. You're found in the river of God. I want you to turn to this last scripture. 
And then we're going to get in the river. I mean, doesn't every kid just want to go swimming? And our, all of our parents said, you got to wait an hour. You'll have a leg cramp. <laughs> it's an old wives' tale. It's been an hour since you've had a donut, so you can get into the river. Revelation 21 and verse 6. Revelation 21 and verse 6. And I'm going to have Miss Marcia come up. Marcia and Monty, what a blessing they are. And a heart. Miss Marcia has a heart. So does Monty. But Miss Marcia has a heart that is unmatched. And so I just asked her to come and play because it's just, it's just beautiful. Revelation 21 and verse 6. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But I want us to get this this morning. To the thirsty, to the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. I want everyone to just close your eyes real quick. We have plenty of time. The Lord is so good. He's, he slowed time down for us this morning. The question that I have for you is the same question that Jesus is asking here in Revelation. He says, are you thirsty? And I believe in our hearts, each and every one of us, we are thirsty. But are we so thirsty that we hunger and thirst for him like Jesus talks about with the Sermon on the Mount? He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after him for they will be filled. They will be filled. And so this morning, if we are so hungry and so thirsty for him, he promises to fill us. He promises to take those places in our heart that are so dry where we need an oasis of living water to spring up. I don't know about you, but there's a difference getting into the pool from your ankle to your knee. That's not that bad. But when you go from your knee to your waist, it's a little bit more commitment. You go from your waist to swimming, it's full commitment. And I believe this morning the Lord is saying, come and drink, come and swim, dive deep. Dive deep. So Jesus, we come and we drink from you this morning. We set our heart towards you this morning and we thank you that you are filling us up to overflowing. You are filling us up to overflowing. I'm going to do this and I've never done this like this before. But this isn't for me to pray for you. This is just a total act of faith. If you want more of him, I just want to encourage you to come down here and kneel before the Lord. Take your heart and kneel it where you are sitting and your heart is saying, God, I want you more than anything this world has to offer. Lately, this world has been really, really, really bold. A boldness that I have never seen. And it's leaked into the heart of the bride. And the Lord is asking that once again, the bride look to the eyes of its beloved. And so Jesus, we come to you with a heart that says we are thirsty and we are hungry for only you. We drink deep from your river, knowing that you are a fountain that never runs dry. We've seen and we've tasted what this world has to offer, but we also taste of you and we see that you are good. Jesus, we drink deep from you. And I feel it in my heart for some of you, you've had loved ones who have turned 
from the Lord, there's been a, a, a prodigal turning, and I want to encourage you, they're coming home. The ones that have looked at you and said, I don't want church, I don't want God, I don't want Jesus, he's not for me, they're coming home in the name of Jesus. The addiction is breaking, the chains are falling off, the mindset that the world has something to offer, we break it in the name of Jesus. But Jesus, we ask that you fill us to overflowing, that our cup runs over. We want to drink deep of you. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Fill us up. Fill us up to overflowing. Fill us up to overflowing. God, we speak a river of life into our marriages, a river of life into our children, a river of life into our health a river of life into our heart, that our heart is no longer dry. There's no, there's no winter. <laughs> the winter's past. Spring is here. The, the turtle dove is singing. Jesus, we thank you for your river. We thank you for your river. We thank you for your river. Refreshing the broken places. Just like Moses struck the rock and water came gushing out, it nourished over two million people. You are the rock of ages. And you were struck for our sins. You were crushed and bruised for our iniquities. And what gushes from you is life nourishing water. Refresh our souls this morning. Start with us. Let the hunger be seen in our heart and in this house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. A river that never runs dry. I feel like some of you that are in here, you're sitting in your chairs and the Lord is filling you even more than the people who are on their knees. <laughs> it's because they, they did a cannonball and it got you wet. <laughs> oh, Jesus, we just thank you for your refreshing water this morning. Filling us up to overflowing. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I, I've felt this all week, and I feel like it's a total sidestep. There's someone in here who has a shoulder. I feel like the Lord's saying it's your right shoulder, but if it's your left sh shoulder, God's fine with that. He, he can work on both. <laughs> but I feel like there's a shoulder that's been either acting up or having issues. And if that's you, I just feel like the Lord's releasing, the Lord's releasing healing into your shoulder right now. Why don't you guys stand to your feet, if you could, please? Hallelujah. Guys, I love you so much. I love you more than you can imagine. And um, three months was way too long. Never again. But I, I, I just keep coming back to this. If there is a shoulder that needs healing. Is it you, Miss Rhonda? We're going to pray over, and Miss Karen, glory to God. We're going to pray. Hold on just a second, Pastor Mike. We're going to pray. Okay, well then you let me have it. <laughs> we just had a board meeting. If you're near the person who has the shoulder, Haley, can you go over to Miss Karen and Miss Jane, can you go to Miss Karen who has her arm up and Miss Rhonda? I want us, oh, Miss, Miss K, okay. Miss Cat as well. Uh, let's see. Miss Linda, can you go back to Miss Cat? 
Miss Kat, can you wave your hand for Miss Linda? Elkie, are you the shoulder? An elbow? No elbow? Well, God healed your elbow. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Miss Casey, can you go to Elkie, please? And you ladies as well. Y'all are, y'all are on fire. Um, this is Miss Elkie right here, the one with the button in her hair. She's so cute. I want us to step into the river, and that means it's not just the, the four-man circus. It's the body. Amen? So, Father, we speak healing to these shoulders, and we thank you that every joint, every ligament is working and functioning. We take the oil of the Holy Spirit and we lube up whatever is not functioning. And we thank you, Jesus, that there is healing, no need for surgery, no need for any physical therapy. Father, we thank you for all the ligaments, all the joints, everything functioning and working as it was created to. We speak healing and we speak life into these shoulders, into the name of Jesus. And we thank you for healing right now that you are the great physician, you are the great healer, and you're bringing healing into their bodies in Jesus' name. Now, if that is you, just kind of work it. Work, work the shoulder. Glory to God. If there's something that you couldn't do, try to do it. Jesus, we just thank you that you are the great finisher. You are faithful to finish what you started. So we speak life and completion. And that throughout the day, it's getting better and better and stronger and stronger. In your precious and mighty and glorious name. <laughs> I hear some laughing. <laughs> I forgot to mention there's joy in the river. If you've ever seen children swimming, they don't swim and cry. There's joy in the river. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You guys can be seated if you want. You can stand. You may be seated. No. Hallelujah. Shh. Healing, healing, healing. Healing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you guys so much. And um, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. This, this past week, I was talking to Mom about the ladies' conference. And I, I did. I said, Mom, what, what games do you want to play? And, and what do you want to do? And she looked at me and she said, I want to draw close to God. We're going to have fun. There's going to be prizes and delicious food. She said, but I want him. And I was like, girlfriend, let's go. So come hungry. Come hungry. And uh, if you know of someone that, that needs a time of refreshment, bring that, that, that sister, the neighbor, the friend, the cousin, the coworker. Uh, let Miss Denise know so she orders enough sandwiches. But, but it's time to get in his river. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Tonight we have service at 6 o'clock. Tuesday is prayer. Wednesday is youth group. Friday is the ladies' conference. Oh, who's preaching tonight? I didn't hear that. Oh, who's preaching tonight? You don't know, do you? Yes. Did you actually know that? Yeah, you better go study. Okay. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this time in your river. And Lord, we refuse to get out. We refuse to get out just because service is over. We want more of you. So our hearts are open. We're ready to be overcome by your river that flows from the throne of the Lamb. And we thank you that this week we splash over everyone we meet in your precious, glorious, and mighty name. And all the children of God said, Amen. 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 Amen.